the Joe Rogan experience. Did you get a chance to look at that chaos book that I that I told you about? Yeah. 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 Tom O'Neill, who is yeah. a friend of my good friend, Greg Fitzsimmons, wrote an insane book that took him 20 years about Manson and the CIA and LSD. And what did you think about all that? Uh, well, you've touched on some, I mean, it's, it's or Tom touched on <laughs> some really interesting things that... Uh, what I liked about his book, and I went through it, I read it, uh, is that he's 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 actually, I think, very honest about the shortcomings, right, of what he ended up doing, right, and 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 the research that he went through, and where he couldn't draw connections. I, I so I give him a lot of credit. I think it's it's well worth the read, um, and you know it's it's a it's a hell of a just a personal story that it took him this fucking long right to make his way through in a variety of reasons but um yeah it, it luckily it's been a tremendous success yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i mean it's really he sold he sold out almost immediately and uh the paperbacks are sold out too i mean he's i think well look Manson reprinting is, it it's a huge draw right it is i mean that, to this but day, it's also yeah. it's a fantastic account account of all the things that happened with the Manson family yeah. and all those people that were alive back then about how this guy kept getting out of jail and they, they kept arresting him and they kept saying this is above my pay grade and they would let him out. Yeah. And that's the, that's for me, that's the strangest part about the whole story. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, this idea that, you know, was Manson, uh, you know, a lab rat for the CIA and, you know, how, how, how far down that rabbit hole do you want to go? Well, O'Neill is pretty clear about that. Right. It's a, that's a, not a particularly solid connection. It's a tenuous connection, right. I think he called it, um, between one of the, what used to be a, 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 a contractor, a researcher for uh, that old chestnut MK Ultra, Jolly um, West. Yeah, yeah, Jolly West. Yeah. What did you think um, about all that? Like, I'm sure you know about Operation Midnight Climax and all the stuff that's <laughs> absolutely true. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it'd be interesting to know how many people are, are, are aware. I mean, I know some people that you know that that's Let's just what they do. Midnight yeah. Climax. Yeah. Operation Midnight Climax was a, a CIA funded program where they dosed up Johns. They created brothels and uh, dosed up Johns with LSD against their knowledge. Yeah, and uh, without their knowledge, and uh, let them uh, fornicate and have a good old time with these uh, ladies of the evening. Man, and my God! And watch them and film them and study them. I know. And when you say it that way, I'm I'm in. If you want money for produce that movie, but it's <laughs> um, I it, it is actually yeah, it's true. Look, it, you have to. It fell under the uh, sort of umbrella of this MK Ultra, which is public knowledge. I'm not, you know, obviously we're not talking that turn. Well, let's um, let's also but, give them the benefit of the doubt. When LSD was synthesized by uh, Albert Hoffman, they really needed to figure out what the fuck this was. And they ne needed to figure out, like, could this be used against Americans? Could this be used against the president? Like, right. What is this? Is this a truth serum? Like, what, what are the benefits? What's the pros and cons? Right. And what are the dangers of this stuff? Well, and and that's a, I from mean, a national security angle, it's very important that they did study it. Right. And so from context, and again, we talked about that the, towards the beginning, is, is, you know, which is something we don't normally do, right? So you, we're, we're judging people from history now. Right. Under the, and, and so we're not using context of, well, what was the what, what were the conditions? We're talking about the so, 19th. 1950s, the 1960s. Well, early, yeah, late 40s even. Right. I mean, so so what have you got? You got the the end of the World War II. You got the Cold War. Uh, it's the late 40s. Uh, you've got the Soviet Union um, that is heavily invested in um, in a variety of experiments. Mind control, uh, brainwashing was the sort of the term of, of of the culture, right? And and brainwashing was a big issue. Uh, it, it, not a big issue, but it was it. it captured people's imagination back then. So the late 40s, early 50s, it was Korean War. Um, yeah, it, we had an existential threat, right? We had nukes pointed at each other. We had, you know, drills in schools, kids hiding under desks. I mean, what the fuck? So uh, with the fear that the Chinese or the Soviets were going to develop uh, mind control abilities was... Uh, Pervasive, and it's sound. I know you know. You talk about it now, and everybody rolls their eyes and goes, "Oh my God!" But you're absolutely right that you have to understand the context with which then Alan Dulles, who was the at the time the director of the CIA, by the way, the guy who Kennedy fired, yes, and wound up being a part of the Warren Commission after Kennedy was murdered, which was very strange. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, <laughs> keep going. Oh, I like that. I like where that could go. Um, <laughs> so. 
Ah, so anyway, uh, we got uh, we got Alan Dulles, who in '53, uh, early in '53, uh, says, "All right, um, we have to understand what the what the uh, the Soviets are doing, particularly the Soviets." Uh, but we also had, you know, again, I, I'm sure some folks listening know all this, but a lot of folks probably don't. We had POWs returning, American POWs returning from Korea. That was a big issue, right, because some of them came back, um, again, quote, unquote, brainwashed, you know, and, and some of them didn't want to return because, you know, again, brainwashing, you know, mind control that, you know, perhaps the Chinese had developed these techniques. So uh, initially, the idea was defensive. How do we protect ourselves against this new threat within this Cold War uh, against these enemies who appear to be devoting a great deal of resources against this? Well, so initially it started out as a defensive effort. MK Ultra was the umbrella name for a whole bunch of over 140 projects, sub-projects underneath MK Ultra. And it was all based around uh, chemical substances, use of chemicals, use of drugs, um, behavioral uh, issues with, with human uh, beings, um, creating false memories, uh, deleting uh, memory, uh, influencing the behavior, again, of, of, of individuals. Uh, there were a variety of projects that fell under this MK Ultra, And it was, again, starting out as a defensive issue, but then quickly became uh, sort of an offense. How do we... How do we become the leader in all of this? Which is typical, right? It's typical in how things develop. It's like cyber warfare. You know, initially it's defensive, and now you think, okay, now we got to figure out how to make it work on our behalf. And sometimes it's important, like when they shut down the Iran nuclear program yeah. with a, a virus, a, essentially a computer virus. You no, know, absolutely. And well, where this went off the rails in, 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 in a handful of ways, in many ways, um, was testing on unwitting subjects. Things such as LSD and, and a variety whoops. of other substances. Yeah, whoops. And those subjects, unwitting subjects, it ranged everything from uh, in federal prisons to uh, state uh, mental hospitals. Um, and that's where Manson comes in. And that's where Manson comes in. And and, um, and a variety of other people, um, you know, who it's just it's it's a, I would recommend people, you know, dig in. Don't you know, don't settle on um just one account. And one of the things that people should also do if they want to read about this is read the, any testimony that came out of the CIA. And, and there was some testimony. There were, there were documents written by the inspector general back in 50. And this, this time period was about 53 um, through at least officially acknowledged 64, 1964. And then the program was wrapped up. Um, supposedly, there were still... Um, uh, federal programs, military programs, others that were still looking into issues related to uh, the use of uh, chemical substances uh, for everything, again, from interrogation to um, uh, behavioral uh, adjustment. And, and a lot of these things were, were funded uh, through cutouts. So you'd set up, again, this is you know early 50s, mid 50s, early 60s, set up um, uh, financing vehicles, you know, through, say, uh, you know, what appear to be uh, non-threatening grant programs, you know, from research institutes. So you'd, 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 you'd loop in uh, academic institutions or researchers. And MKUltra had, at least acknowledged anyway, over 80 uh, academic institutions and, and others um, that were either wittingly or unwittingly working on their behalf in various research programs. So, yeah, this, this uh, Midnight Climax program, basically, they'd, they'd kit out a safe house as a brothel, um, and they would uh, uh, have the hookers uh, slip LSD or whatever substance to the, to the Johns. Um, and then behind a, a mirror, you'd have a supposed a, like a researcher, right? I mean, this is where it got weird. <laughs> Sitting there, you know, having a drink and, and watching these you know, the, the hooker and the John have sex, and then they'd be analyzing the impact of the LSD on them in terms of their ability to talk, and, and would they... Was you know, the hooker in on it? Yeah, the hooker was in on it. And was they, she an employee of the CIA? Uh, you know, you know and, and it, was, it, it wasn't just the agency, you know, like the Army was involved in these things mm -hmm. as well. But um, they would get, you know, cash payments, and uh, oftentimes the, uh, the get-out-of-jail-free get card. Um 
I, you know what? Ladies, this, if you're out yeah, there, if you're out there, listen to me. Come on. <laughs> Whatever you need, come forward. I'm here for come you. Forward. But come there was on a, the show. There Let's was a, talk. You can wear a, a Boba Fett mask. <laughs> I don't care. We'll hide your identity. Oh, I don't know why God. I said Boba Fett? But I mean, just imagine. I mean, so it's okay. So this was clearly, you know, clearly uh, was off the rails, right? Yeah. And and they had a one of the guys that was involved in this. Uh, uh, he was with the, what what used to be called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. A guy named uh, White, George White, um, was, you know, involved in like the San Francisco cat house. And, you know, according to the stories, he'd sit there, and, you know, with a martini in his hand and watch the couple have sex. And then he and he would have like prepped the the hooker to say, OK, after sex. Now, this appears to be the best time to get them talking. So ask them about their job and let's see if they'll talk about their job. The idea being, could we influence and, and like uh, entrap uh, potential assets overseas for operational reasons. You know, is, was there some use, you know, for operational purposes? But basically, it was just, you know, George getting his rocks off, watching couples having sex, and, you know, he, it, it, very, very strange shit. Uh, but you're right in that. And, and so, again, this this went on till 64. MK Ultra, interestingly enough, not to, not to spend too much time on it, but uh, Richard Helms was the director at the time uh, in the early 70s. And uh, he and a guy named uh, Gottlieb, Sidney Gottlieb, who was the head of technical services of the agency, they agreed that the smart thing to do in 73, before Richard Helms left and Gottlieb left uh, the agency, was to destroy all the records. So they purged all the records of MK Ultra that they, they thought existed. Um, this was investigating the church committee back in 75. And then, uh, uh, 76, I think it was, they found a bunch of financial records, you know, that, that had not been purged because they had been kept, you know, au um, audits uh, of, uh, and again, you're talking about like 149 subprojects of MK Alter. So you can imagine each subproject has its own accounting and you got to turn in your receipts for the LSD that you bought or the hooker you paid off or whatever, you know, so here's my receipt. Can I have my $12 or whatever you paid for a hooker back then? And so probably not 12 bucks. Uh, but uh, they found some financial records, um, and so that became then the, a matter of another investigation up on the Hill. Um, and Stansfield Turner, the time the CIA director testified at that point, and that's why I brought my laptop, is because Stansfield Turner's uh, testimony is actually pretty interesting uh, as far as MK Ultra goes. And he talks about... Um, We've attempted to group the activities covered by the 149 subprojects into categories under descriptive headings, <laughs> All right, wouldn't you? In broad outline, at least, this presents the contents of these files. Uh, the headings of the categories of all these various projects that ran under MKUltra, and this gives you a, a, a pretty good quick sense of, of what they were doing at the time, research into the effects of behavioral drugs and or alcohol. There were 17 sub projects probably not involving human testing. This is a testimony from the director of the CIA, Stansfield Turner. 14 subprojects definitely involving tests on human volunteers. Volunteers. 19 subprojects uh, sub probably including tests on human volunteers. While not known, some of these subprojects may have included tests on unwitting subjects as well. Mm. While not known? Well, not known. <laughs> and then six subprojects yeah, definitely involving tests on unwitting subjects. Uh, research on hypnosis. Uh, acquisition of chemicals or drugs, aspects of magician's art. No. What? Magician's art? Yeah. Yeah, like slipping them a Mickey or something. You know, how do you do that sleight of hand? Uh, studies of human behavior, sleep research, behavioral changes during psychotherapy, um, motivational studies, studies of defectors, assessment and training techniques, polygraph research, funding mechanisms for MK Ultra external research activities. Research on drugs, toxins, and biologicals in human tissue. Activities whose subjectives cannot be determined from available documentation. <laughs> anyway, it goes on. But it gives you a sense of, of, of what the hell was, was happening during this period of time. But again, I, this doesn't justify it. Obviously, mm -hmm. it doesn't. But you're absolutely right that to have a full understanding of this, you have to look at the, at the context of what, you know, where we were at that time. And where we were was smack dab in, in the height and, uh, and uh, elevation of the Cold War, knowing that our adversaries, our existential threats, were engaged in this sort of behavior. Now, George White was not really a researcher or anything. He was just sitting behind a mirror watching some people you know, get off. So 
clearly, and, and all the unwitting subjects involved. I mean, but look, they were slipping uh, LSD to uh, agency employees right, without telling them. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, it's just... Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not that long ago, but it's we, not. we have to think about it in terms of the same way we thought about Abraham Lincoln. In the context of the times, this wasn't such a horrendous thing to do. They didn't know any better. It was, it was a, really they didn't know what these substances would do to people, and there wasn't a lot of ways to find out. You know, the Harvard LSD studies that they did that they believe in, in part were responsible for the Unabomber. There's a lot of other shit that was responsible for the yeah. Unabomber, including particularly his childhood. But they they did a lot of these studies because they they didn't know. I mean, there's it's one way to find out. I mean, how do you get responsible human subjects? How do you get people to do? Well, there's not a lot of ways other than just test people. Right, and unfortunately, yeah. What what this ended up being was you know like using. <laughs> Using the most marginalized people out yes. there, you know, like sex workers or prisoners right. or whatever, right? Uh, and, or Johns. and oftentimes, uh, you yeah. know, Johns are just just un, you know, but that whole thing. But where where Tom O'Neill's book is is you know is is really interesting in a couple of ways is isn't in, if you if you jump. So MK Ultra kind of finished up in '64 officially, right? That's when you know the uh, Inspector General came out from the agency and said, "This you got to know, you can't <laughs> you can't do this." They had a new Inspector General and, and they looked and said, "This is." clearly not where we are supposed to be. Um, but interestingly, uh, funding mechanisms, you know, that were used to, again, to dole out grants or to provide a cutout between government and research that was being done, you know, did some of those continue to exist for other uh, programs, other research? And in 67, uh, you know, you have uh, the Summer of Love, San Francisco, um, and Tom O'Neill writes about this, and it's very, very interesting. But you had the the, the Haight Ashbury uh, Free Medical Clinic, right? which in part uh, was running a couple of projects that were uh, supposedly getting funding from the National Institute for Mental Health, which had previously been a funding mechanism also for MK Ultra. You know, a few years in the past, and. Uh, Roger Smith was a, a guy who was getting his Ph.D. in criminology. He was working at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, and he was also Manson's parole officer. And uh, to your point, Manson was like – he was like a, a, a brook trout or a, a rainbow trout that is in some catch-and-release stream, right? He was constantly arrested during the 67, 68 period. And remember, his, the, the killings happened in – summer of uh, August of 69. Uh, and, you know, he kept getting released. And he had been in prison, right? He, he, in 67, he had, early in that year, he'd been released from prison. Right? So he was on probation. Any violation, certainly some of the things he was getting arrested for, should have sent him back to prison, but he wasn't. So that, to me, is one of the most interesting parts of the book, is this, 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 this revolving door that Manson was in. And eventually, we all know what happened to him. Um, but yeah, working at the Haight Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, that's where Manson would go, uh, along with some of his followers. And, and you know, they were, you know, part of a study. And you know, they were, I'm sure, you know, getting their LSD from there. But um, also, this guy Jolly West, who was involved in MK Ultra, uh, also ended up having an office at the Haight Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. So, but uh, again, to Tom O'Neill's point. Do you know that point, clinic closed down about four months after Tom's book came out? Been open for over 50 years. It's crazy. Yeah. What are the odds? Yeah. I know. What are the odds? <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Uh, yeah. But I mean, you know, again, it's, it's, I, like the, I like the book because he does seem to be uh, trying to let the, the facts of all his research lead the way right. rather than trying to prove a point that he comes up with at the beginning of his book. Well, he also exposed the prosecutor, Bugliosi, and all the, the issues that was, was going on with him that led to him wanting to follow the narrative that they had laid out, that Manson was trying to incite a race war and right. you know, and ignore all the other indicators that there was some deeper connections and yeah was manson a uh, was he an informer for the bureau or or for local law enforcement or you know some other outfit i you know that's uh hard to tell hard to tell but it's compelling in light of the fact that he 
<laughs> he kept getting released. He, could, yeah. he seemed to have a get out of jail free card. He also seemed to have an unlimited supply of acid. Mm. That was what's fascinating. And he also seemed to employ the same techniques that apparently the CIA had employed when they had done experiments on prisoners, including the fact that he would, you know, force them into weird sexual situations and pretend to take LSD himself but not really participate and then, you know, influence them. And he seemed to be doing things to them in terms of, like, trying to alter their behavior and getting them to do things that were outside the norm, including murder. Yeah. I mean, did he see... Yeah. Did he have a sense from his time there uh, at the clinic or dealing with, uh, what's his name, Roger Smith, his parole officer, who, again, was also a, you know, a criminology doctor, a doctoral ca- candidate, I guess. And so was, was you know, but, but look, Manson was, you know, he was not a rocket scientist. He was illiterate for the most part right? yeah. until he ended up in prison and, and, uh, and maybe. Who Which knows? is why yeah. it was so weird that he was able to manipulate so many people so well. Right. He, but it was also, it's like what he was the perfect guinea pig. I mean, you're talking about a guy who spent half his life in federal penitentiaries. Yeah, yeah, and 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 also you, you're putting it in context of the time. Um, what else did you have going on? You had sort of this again, this uh, awareness of the impact of LSD on the on the counterculture, right? So you had federal agencies like the bureau, and uh, for example, worrying about, oh my God, what's the you know what what, what are these hippies going to do next? You know, right. are they going and you know they were worried. Obviously about uh, the Black Panthers, but it was also more than that. It was the it was the again, anti-war this, movement. Yeah, the, just the general counterculture and the impact of drugs on it, and so it's a it's a fascinating. I think it's a I think it's a very interesting read, and I think it's worth the read because again, he he spent so much time trying to make his way through and get this years. book. Yeah, it's a crazy story, and if you haven't heard the podcast, please listen to it with Tom O'Neill. <laughs>